Ruiz is a uh, postdoctoral research associate at the Minor Institute. He was recommended um, by some colleagues in Wisconsin, and uh, I think, Louise, you did your PhD in Wisconsin, is that right? Yeah, master's and PhD. Master's and PhD, and um, just learned today that Louise is moving down to Florida where he got a, a job at uh, the University of Florida down there. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing some of what he has to say about how to increase digestibility in corn, grain, and silage. Louise, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, and thank you all for attending this seminar. Uh, if by any chance you watch uh, one of Randy Shaver's seminar before, you may be familiarized with some of the slides I will be presenting, because uh, most of those slides, they were from my master's and PhD work under his supervision. So hopefully most of the concepts I'll be presenting today, they are not brand new although I'll try to show a novel approach for most of those. In order to understand um, how to increase the start digestibility, uh, we'll need to give you a small background on how start digestion is done in ruminants. And also later, we'll try to see how can you measure start digestibility on farm, because what's the point of increasing it if you don't know if you're really increasing, right? And that's why fecal starch plays a major role. And hopefully by the end of the day, I'll be able to convince you that fecal starch is a good tool, a good tool to evaluate, at least in the high producing cows group. So start digesting ruminants is slightly different than humans. Uh, for example, humans, after we start eating, we have amylase that degrades starch. Uh, that is produced by salivary glands. The ruminants do not have that. So start digestion will start primarily in the rumen. And in my opinion, and I'll try to convince you about that uh, in a couple of slides, this is the most important site of digestion for starch. So in the rumen, starch is mainly digested by microbial fermentation. Those microbials have enzymes and they will degrade starch and produce VFA, mainly propionate. And propionate, it's a predictor of glucose uh, in the liver. So that's why starch digesting in the room is so important because more propionate the bugs produce, more glucose will be produced in the liver, more energy will be available for an animal. But in the room, uh, starch can also yield a different uh, end product, and this is microbial protein synthesis, okay? The starch by itself cannot produce microbial protein synthesis, but in combination with uh, protein degradation or rumen degradable protein, RDP, uh, if we have a good combination of starch and protein, we can use a lot of microbial protein synthesis. And this is important for two different reasons. First, uh, if you go to this graph, you see that we increase the level of dietary rumen degradable starch and compares with milk protein content. As you increase levels of rumen degradable starch, normally you increase milk protein. And this is mainly related to this uh, microbial protein synthesis yield that starch can give us. Um, I will not show any data related to that, but at the same time that we increase protein, uh, either content or yield, we are decreasing nitrogen excretion. For example, uh, milk urea nitrogen levels are always lower when we increase the digestibility of starch or total starch in the diet. Okay. And normally, when we decrease milk urea nitrogen, we also decrease urinary excretion of nitrogen. Uh, so this may also help you with uh, how to handle the extra nitrogen that's going to the field if you have this issue at your farm. Louise, I just wanted to quick ask a question of the, the farmers in the room. Um, Absolutely. How many of you feel pretty comfortable um, when you're nutritionist, you're talking to your nutritionist, are you pretty comfortable with the lingo uh, related to rumen degradable protein, microbial protein, uh, that kind of thing. Is that something you're familiar with? Because I know some farmers love nutrition, other mm -hmm. people, they have their other forte and they just delegate that. Um, 
So where are you on that spectrum? You look like you're pretty comfortable somewhere in the middle. Put your faith in. Okay, so we have some who also uh, trust the, the professionals more. Mm -hmm. So maybe, um, so rumen degradable protein, familiar term. Bypass protein, familiar term. Okay, microbial protein, familiar. Okay, so basically what he's talking about is that the rumen microbes, they take in the plant protein and they look at it and they say, this isn't useful to me. So they tear it apart to the degree that they can, and then they put those building blocks, blocks back together so they can make more, pro, uh, more microbes like themselves. Some of the protein, they can't do that to, and that is what they call the bypass protein. And so that's what is, uh, we're, you're trying to match starch with those things to let the microbes do what they do best. But if yeah. you don't have enough starch, they can't do it. Is that? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and if they don't have enough starch, then all that nitrogen is in the rumen, and that gets into the blood, and then it goes, uh, gets into the milk, and then your MUN levels go up, and that's what you're. That's kind of a gauge of how how well you're. One of the gauges of how well you're doing. What's, what's the right area for your MUN? Okay, you hear the question, Louise? No. Um, the question is, what's a uh, your MUN levels, where do you want to see that? Uh, what are, where does a, what do you call a red flag uh, as far as MUN levels go? Um, lower than 10 normally is considered a red flag, but also I like to keep it below uh, 15 or 16. It's not always doable, especially uh, if you have um, fresh groups or uh, very high producing cows groups because normally you really don't want to mess up with protein in those diets. So sometimes you go a little bit higher than you should just to make sure that they will have it. Uh, but if, if you keep it below 16, 15, you are fine. Uh, and I normally try to control milk protein levels rather than MUN levels. I just mentioned that because it fits perfectly with nitrogen excretion since uh, MUN it's highly correlated with urinary extraction, excretion of nitrogen, but below 15, 16, you should be fine. And you said that you like the, you, if it's below 10, then you start to worry a little bit? Yeah, there are some theories that if you have very low MUN, you may have, uh, you probably don't have enough protein in the diet, but I think you'll be able to see that you don't have enough protein in the diet by low milk production. So yeah. this would be the first red flag rather than MUN, in my opinion. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Okay, and continuing, uh, although starch brings a lot of benefits uh, towards uh, nitrogen utilization or uh, milk protein production, at the same time, we have a negative fat on milk fat content, okay? And I certainly understand that a lot of farmers are paid by uh, milk fat content as well, so, all the time you increase the gradability of starch, there are two things you can do. Uh, first of all, increase buffering capacity, either through the use of additives or through the use of uh, more physically effective fiber. Uh, physically effective fiber will help a lot with rumination and consequently uh, you won't have a huge drop in milk fat content. Another option is, as you use a much more digestible starch, uh, you could try to decrease a little bit total starch in the diet, because this way um, you would be using corn very well, but you wouldn't be increase the total dietary room and degradable starch. So in other words, you are probably feeding a similar level of dietary room and degradable starch or slightly higher, but uh, you are using it more uh, efficiently. And this is probably the only time in this presentation I'll mention that, but keep in mind the most part of the time that we increase drastically starch digestibility, you may see some decrease in milk fat content, okay? However, um, you don't see this huge drop in milk fat yield. And the, at the end of the day, uh, milk fat yield is what you are paid, not milk fat content, okay? And this happens because normally uh, 
greater star digestibility translates into greater milk production. And I will show a couple of slides on that a little bit later. So if by any chance starch is not digested in the rumen, and I know I said any chance, most of, uh, a lot of it probably won't, just because cows, high producing cows eat so much, it's gonna pass through fast uh, through the rumen. So when starch reaches the small intestine, it will be also digested into glucose. The difference is that it's digested directly into glucose. And that's why sometimes you see a lot of people saying that maybe we should shift digest, digestion of starch from the rumen to the small intestine, because in the rumen, you need to go towards propionate and later glucose, while in the small intestine goes directly to glucose, okay? And although this sounds reasonable, this may not be as efficient, and not because you lose something uh, to an intermediate process like in the rumen, but because we don't really know how glucose is used after uh, it's di uh, starch is digested in the small intestine. Okay, so all the time you hear people saying that we should shift digestion, be a little bit careful with that. Okay? And the starch that's not digesting the small intestine is digested in the uh, hand gut, and again, will be microbial fermentation towards VFA production. And although there is production of microbial protein senses, it's not used because it's excreted in the feces. Okay? That's why it's, you cannot see that in this slide. Normally, uh, and as I said, be careful with increasing uh, small intestine digestion of starch because if you focus on rumen digestibility of starch, you see that you increase the total tract digestibility of starch. And the reason is what normally is not digested in the rumen probably cannot be digested post-ruminally, uh, at least part of that. And most of the ways you can shift digestibility of starch today is either through using a less digestible source of starch, which I'm really against, or through reduction of rumen degradable protein. So this way you have less uh, bugs and because of that less digestion. Well, everybody that works with dairy cows know that if you don't provide enough protein in the rumen, because they're not gonna produce milk. So I'm, I really don't recommend that, okay? And normally when you increase the total digestibility of starch, you also increase milk yield, okay? And that's why I mentioned earlier that uh, milk fat yield is not decreased when you uh, increase the starch digestibility. Or if it's decreased, it's not a lot, so you don't really lose money on that. So now we'll shift to how can we increase starch digestibility? And again, feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions about what I'm talking. Um, we will start with whole plant corn silage. So today the main focus will be the yellow portion of corn silage, which mainly comprised by starch. And from a literature review, uh, Dr. Shaver and I, we saw that starch digestibility in dairy cows fed corn silage-based diets varies from 80 to virtually 100%. And this is a lot of variance. So we decided to dig into literature to try to figure out uh, what are the main factors that can cause this huge variance in starch digestibility in those diets. And these five factors are certainly the five most important factors. And in my opinion, this is really the order that you should consider it kernel particle size, duration of silage fermentation, and this is the uh, newest data we'll be presenting today, uh, kernel maturity at harvest, uh, potential endosperm properties, and when I mention endosperm properties, I'm talking about uh, hybrids that have a lot of flory endosperm. I'll soon explain what it is. And last, but still experimental, additives, uh, if you ever uh, had opportunity to watch one of Dr. Limincon's presentation. He's talking in very high regard about protease. I completely agree with him on this topic. The problem is, as far as I know, there is no protease in the market, um, unless something came up in the last couple months, okay? So kernel particle size is very important because 
corn is a seed, right? And because it can be used as a seed. So because of that, uh, there is a seed coat around it. And it's normally very hard because the seed coat, uh, it's supposed to protect the endosperm of corn, right? So if you don't break it, bacteria in the rumen or enzymes in the small intestine cannot reach starch. Okay, so that's why it's so important to break kernels. But after the kernel is broken, there is also some chemical factors uh, that we call zine or prolamine that are specific types of protein that they surround starch. Uh, they also inhibit digestibility of starch. Uh, duration of silage fermentation is important because uh, bacteria in the silo, somehow they are able uh, to break down those proteins that surround the starch, making it more available. And because of that, we decided to test duration of silo fermentation as a potential tool to overcome negative effects of maturity or hybrids on starch digestibility. And I'll show some slides later today. Uh, maturity is important because very often we will decide to leave corn in the field a little bit longer because the starch is still accumulating, right? And everybody wants a greater starch yield per acre. Uh, the problem is at the same time that starch is accumulating, those zinc or prolamine proteins, they are also accumulating. So maybe the extra starch you have by allowing corn to stand a little bit longer in the field is less digestible. So you probably won't see a benefit of that. In terms of hybrids, it's the same thing. If you have hybrids with more flory endosperm, it means that you have less of those proteins. So this will allow for greater digestibility. But the problem is most of the hybrids are available. They are not that flory, they're more vitreous, which means that they have more of those proteins. So during my master's, I had opportunity to run uh, a review article to evaluate some harvest practice. And the first thing that we evaluated was maturity. And we used dry matter content uh, at harvest as an indicator of maturity. I certainly understand that you also should combine uh, kernel milk line to this equation. But the problem is researchers are not good defining kernel milk line. Okay, we need to teach them about that. So that's why we use dry matter content as a proxy for that. So if you, if you pay attention to this specific table, you see that uh, we divided those in categories. And you can see that milk yield is lower for dairy cows fed diets containing silage with more than 40% dry matter. Okay. And this is mainly related to this last row here, to the TTSD that stands for total tract starch digestibility. Okay, so in other words, less starch being digested really means lower milk production. And we think that this is related to two main things. One is what I described as the accumulation of those zinc proteins together with starch. And the other one is related to kernel processing. And I will explain why so. Okay. The second thing we tried to evaluate during this uh, experiment was the effectiveness of kernel processing. So we're dividing three categories. Uh, when the harvester used the cracker, okay, or the kernel processor, uh, and was really tight from one to three millimeters, uh, not very tight, what we describe as four to eight millimeters, or did not use a processor, okay? There is a confounding factor in this uh, data set because many years ago, when uh, research was being done on this topic, um, the unprocessed treatments, they were in a much lower theoretical length of cut. And they used to do that because as you get the knives closer, they will hit more kernels and break more kernels. Okay? So some of these results here may be biased, especially for this unprocessed treatment. Okay? So if you go to the total track start digestibility row first, you see that start digestibility is much lower uh, when the rows are not tight enough. And this really translates into lower milk production, okay? 
although it's only one pound per day uh, different between one to three millimeters versus unprocessed, you can see that digestibility is still lower for the unprocessed, even though many of the data set uh, containing unprocessed treatments were with very finely ground whole plant corn silage. Okay, and this tells us that you really need to use processor if you have one available. Okay? And I'm saying that because, especially if you like to harvest silage at a greater maturity, because if you look to this specific graph, you see that silage harvest lower than 28% or up to 32% per matter, the processor is not really effective, okay? And the reason is the kernel is not too hard yet, and those zinc proteins are not really there yet. But by no means I'm saying that you do not to use a processor during this time, okay, if you harvest this specific uh, type of corn silage. Make sure you use it as a guarantee that kernels will be really broken. As you go from 32 to 40%, processor is really important. You know, it really increased digestibility of silage. But when you go to silage above 40% or matter, the processor is ineffective. In other words, you're not breaking kernels if you, if you get the two major corn silage, okay? And that's a huge problem because you are really relying on the processor to do its job in this specific silage that has more prolamine or zinc proteins rolling in starch, and it does not, okay? The same way, if you harvest whole plant corn silage with a very long theoretical length of cut, the processor is also ineffective. And the reason for that is when you have very long uh, fiber particles going through the rows, uh, normally a lot of kernels will be in between those particles and it attenuates the breakage, okay? So also be careful with that. Although to be honest with you, it's really hard to reach this level of uh, this length of cut because you will need to remove knives and nobody recommends to remove knives today because you, you may lose warranty of your harvester, uh, they are more susceptible to breakage and several other things. And just to show you how important it is related to fecal starch, you see that as kernel processing score decrease or corn silage processing score decrease, fecal starch increase. Okay, so in other words, if you don't break kernels, they really go to the manure. Okay, so you probably will see that visually. You don't really need to measure that to see, but by measuring, we can prove that. And this is a data set provided by Kristen Hansen during the last International Silage Conference. So how can we know if we were able to break enough kernels during harvest? So this is a very simple um, procedure you can run during harvest and provides you real-time data so you can make the necessary adjustment at harvest, okay? I don't have a picture of that, but I really like to use uh, a black garbage bag. So I put a black garbage bag on the floor. I grab a couple of samples, throw in this black garbage bag. I leave it in the sun for 15, 20 minutes. So the samples dry a little bit. It's easier to do the process when the sample is a little bit drier. So you get a bucket. Okay, here you have a tube, but you can use a bucket uh, and has exactly the same uh, quality. Just fill that with water throw the silage sample, then gently agitate the material for one or two minutes, and you see that the kernels, they separate from fiber. The kernels, they are denser. So they go to the bottom of the bucket while the fiber stays on top. So you are able to remove uh, slowly the fiber that's floating. You can put the water out, and then you end up only with kernels. Okay, it's much easier to see kernel breakage only looking to kernels rather than the whole whole plant corn silage sample. So then you can compare the different types of uh, kernel breakage. And obviously the one on the right is the one that has uh, more broken kernels. A good way to see that is try to make a circle. Uh, uh, just try to put that in a dessert plate and make sure you don't have any intact kernels on that plate. Okay, 
Certainly you may find one or two, but the goal is to don't have any intact kernel. And I really recommend you doing that because you can do adjustments real time. And uh, a lot of people already use this methodology and it's really, really effective. So real quick, um, how many people have ever done that procedure that he's talking about? Have you ever done that? Uh, do you all harvest your own corn or do you rely on custom? Custom? We, we do most of our self custom. Mm -hmm. To do your own. Okay, so we have two rely, rely on custom guys and two who do their own. Um, how do you, but you do check? Yeah, I just saw this process this winter. You know, I think it was very really cheaper. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a, that's a lot quicker than, you know, we put it on a ground and spread it around, spread it around like, and check the camera. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah even if you have custom harvester, uh, harvesting corn for you, make sure you go through samples because um, I'm not saying that they don't do their job well, okay, they do, but uh, if you pay them per hour of work rather than, or by field rather than silage quality, they may try to go faster. And as you make process tighter, it, it, it slow downs a little bit the process. So it's always good to keep track on what's going on. And, you know, I really recommend you to do that every three or four loads, just in case, because, uh, you know, the roses start, start getting apart after some time. Sharps get less uh, sharpened. So you need to make sure that you have a consistent product throughout the entire harvest. So it, even if you're not there, uh, make sure you have someone going through those samples for you. This is really important. So the next topic uh, I will present is related to silage fermentation. So length of silage fermentation, and it really increased start digestibility, okay? There's no doubt that this happened. The question is, can we use that as a tool uh, to attenuate the negative effects of hybrids or maturity? Uh, on start digestibility. So I run an experiment comparing BMR and leafy hybrids. BMR normally are more vitreous than leafy hybrids, okay? And we, what we normally expect to see is start digestibility are those green lines, and as fermentation progress, it's gonna increase, right? And the reason is ammonia nitrogen and soluble crude protein also increase, and this happens because the zinc or uh, prolamine proteins, they are insoluble. So the bacteria break them into soluble protein. So that's why this happens in the silo, okay? So what we expect to happen is uh, leafy would start much more digestible and BMR would catch up later uh, on start digestibility. But that's not what happened in this trial. And I don't really know why. Actually, uh, they started very similar and the difference between those hybrids increased over time. And this really confused us during that time because we expected the opposite. So we decided to run a second experiment, much larger experiment. Uh, so we compared three different hybrid types. One that was really digestible, this leafy flory, and two different maturities, okay? Although we had par different particle size, we didn't see any fact, so I won't make comments about that. And we tested the use of protease and was good. Uh, not as good as Dr. Liming Kung's data, but still very nice to use. And the goal is not to compare hybrids in this presentation, but to see, uh, or maturity, but to see the potential effects of extended fermentation on those two factors, okay? So what we were able to see is that independent of the hybrid that you use, as silage stay longer in the silo, you really increase digestibility, okay, for all three hybrids. The problem is the difference either uh, was maintained after a lot of fermentation or it was exacerbated like in this one, okay? So we are not really solving the hybrid problems with extended inciting time. And this is really scary because uh, a lot of people in the industry says that fermentation solves for everything. And this is not true at all. Instantly, they work for seed companies. Okay? I'm not pointing fingers to anyone, though. So um, if you ever see corn, that's the type of corn you want to see. Extremely white rather than extremely yellow. Okay? 
Yellow corn normally looks much better. That's what the human industry wants, but that's not what the dairy uh, cows want. So okay. I have a quick, quick question for people in the room. When you go to buy your corn seed, how many of you are hearing your seed salespeople talking about flowery endosperm corn? Not really. Louise, are you, are you, have you been in contact with any of the, you know, mycogen, Pioneer, Monsanto to find out what they have in the pipeline yep. relative to flowery? Yep. Um, the master choice has a nice flowery hybrids. Okay. Uh, Pioneer uh, doesn't really focus on that. They try, they, they have some good hybrids, especially related to yield, but they don't really focus on uh, flowery hybrids. Uh, mycogen, the main thing that they sell is BMR, and BMR is more about NDF digestibility than starch digestibility. But I'm aware that they are trying to incorporate flory endosperm to their hybrids. I don't know when this will be in the market, but they are trying to do that. Uh, so at this point, uh, Master Choice has a lot of flory hybrids, and I forgot the name of the other company. There is another company that is also selling some flory hybrids. Um, That's good. No, I genetics. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't have the name here, but I. I can get it. Um, so you know, it's it's important to see that. Obviously, that sometimes the flory corn, similarly to BMR, uh, they have lower yield. Okay, it's not every time, but sometimes they do. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Okay, so in. The thing is, we need to keep forcing companies to do both, increase yield and increase quality. Uh, but what I'm seeing today is that they are trying to increase only one of those and use the other as the excuse, unfortunately. Okay. And maturity was also not solved by silent time. Okay, So all the time you see someone say, no, just harvest uh, corn uh, later. If you have more starch, don't do that. Fermentation is not going to solve for that. Okay. So a quick summary about corn silage. Break more kernels. If you have enough inventory, allow silage to ferment for an extended period. Ideally, it would be nice to start feeding the new corn silage only after four months of fermentation. I certainly understand that sometimes we don't have area to do that. But if you do, you could use that as a one-year investment that pays off. Okay, it's, it's really good. Um, harvest at the correct maturity because it's really hard to break kernels if they are too, uh, if they are, uh, too hard because of maturity or uh, fermentation is not going to sow for that. If you have those hybrids available, use more flory endosperm hybrids. Okay? But try to rely on hybrid performance trials that are conducted near your farm. Okay, uh, because sometimes what's great in Florida, for example, may not be great here and vice versa. Okay, and I put additives with a lot of question marks because at this point, I don't know when we will have those protease additives in the market. So shifting gears to corn grain, and when I mention corn grain, is either dry corn or high moisture corn. Everything that affects corn silage affects corn grain. Okay, so particle size is a main thing. You need to break kernels as much as you can. Uh, one extra treatment you may have with uh, corn grain is that you can sting treat those. For example, steam flake corn. They are more expensive, but they are more digestible. Okay, so you need to calculate income over feed costs to see if uh, steam flake corn could be a good thing for your herd. Uh, um, how many of you use steam flake corn? Okay. <clears throat> Do you have, you, do you have uh, any sense of, I know that it's an ingredient that you use under some circumstances, do you have any sense of what the payback on that is, or actually you use it, how much more do you pay per ton for it? Uh, I, I don't have values on that because steam flake corn is not a big thing here in the Northeast. Uh, it's much more used in the uh, Southwest, right? completely different direction. So I normally mention as a possibility, but I don't think we would have access a lot to steam flake corn in this area uh, on a good price. So I don't even have an idea on that. Uh, yeah, okay. 
Okay, thank you. And um, storage also plays a role, for example, dry versus high moisture corn. And at this point, I'm sure you all know that high moisture corn is more digestible because of ensiling, right? Because the bugs are doing the job for us, breaking down those uh, insoluble protein. But maturity of harvest also plays an important role on high moisture corn, and not only because of accumulation of those proteins or the same proteins, but also because high moisture corn, if you don't have enough uh, moisture on that, um, it doesn't ferment well. And if it doesn't ferment, the bugs are not going to break those proteins, so it, it, it won't be good. And the same way as corn silage, fermentation length, also helps with start digestibility. Endosperm type is exactly the same thing. If you have those hybrids available, they will be more digestible in dry corn and high moisture corn. So if you compare high moisture corn, steam flake corn, and ground corn, you see that rum ruminal digestibility of starch is greater for high moisture corn compared to the other two. And in the, and both high moisture corn and steam flake corn are more digestible than ground corn. Okay? And this is important because although uh, you don't see difference in milk production, you see that high moisture corn has a slightly lower intake and because of that you have greater feed efficiency. So cows are eating less but producing the same, so probably your income over feed cost would be higher. The problem is the greater ruminal start digestibility slightly decreased milk fat on those cows. Okay, so again, you need to make sure you pay attention to that. Particle size, it, it's as important in dry corn as in corn silage. You can see that as we uh, increase the geometric mean particle size of corn grain, you decrease total tract start digestibility. And this is also true for high moisture corn. Okay? Unfortunately, we didn't have enough data points to make a, a graph with more categories, but it's as important to grind enough high moisture corn as dry corn. The problem is, if you, if you try to go through finally ground with high moisture corn, you may have uh, issues during the grinding process, okay? Because since it's wet, it's gonna, uh, you're gonna have a lot of corn sticking into the seeds, so it may need to stop for some time. So ideally, you probably should focus on uh, 1,500 microns or 2,000 microns for high moisture corn, whereas the best way would be 500 up to 1,000 microns for dry corn, okay? Fermentation length, linearly increase high moisture corn start digestibility. So similarly to whole plant corn silage, if you're able to start feeding high moisture corn after three or four months of storage would be ideal because material would be more digestible. And this explains why sometimes we see uh, milk fat drops uh, during the spring or milk production drops during the fall, right? You're feeding the, uh, when you are feeding the new silage, it's less digestible, so you have a milk drop during the fall. When you are feeding the more digestible silage during the spring, you have issues with milk fat. Okay, so it fits what we see in the field. Uh, any of you saw that at your farm? Anybody? Yeah. I, do any of you do high moisture? Nobody, yeah, nobody here really does high moisture. Okay. Yeah, uh, does anybody do snappage? Yeah, inventory is a problem. Um, okay. Not in general. So we don't have that luxury, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I certainly understand. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it could be something, in some cases, you might be able to buy high, high moisture corn from somebody. Okay. Well, if you ever buy that, make sure you check for dry matter content and fermentation profile. Because as I mentioned, if, uh, if you have low moisture or high dry matter content, uh, the fermentation is worse. So in vitro starch digestibility is worse. Okay, I normally try to target on 72% dry matter, uh, but there are a lot of places people go to 75 and, well, above 75, I don't consider high moisture corn anymore, okay, because it doesn't really ferment well. So then it's just wet dry corn, in my opinion, okay, so 
keep that in mind. So a quick summary on corn grain and moisture corn. You need to break kernels, break as much as you can, okay? If you have inventory and can use high moisture corn, let it ferment, it ferment for longer periods. Make sure you harvest at the correct maturity, otherwise it's not gonna ferment. And when hybrids are available with floriandosperm, uh, they should be the best option. But we, we discuss a lot on, uh, okay, start digestibility is important, uh, but how do we ac access that on farm, right? And uh, fecal starch is probably the most reliable procedure available today. Um, it's a very simple procedure. Um, obviously, if you have a fecal sample like this, where you can see a lot of kernels everywhere, you don't need to analyze for fecal starch, you know you have a problem, right? But when we are handling dry corn and high moisture corn, sometimes we don't see as clearly as when we don't break whole plant corn silage kernels. So it's a good tool to evaluate uh, starch digestibility. The way it works is we can combine fecal starch with predictive equations. I will show you uh, one equation that I helped to develop uh, in Wisconsin under Dr. Randy Shaver's lab. And um, you can use that to predict total tract starch digestibility. One thing that you need to keep in mind is that it reflects the total diet, not specific feed stuff. So my fecal starch is high. Oh, it's my corn silage. Not necessarily. If you only use corn silage as a starch source, yes it is, but if you use other starch sources, may not be, okay? So you need to, after uh, evaluating fecal starch, evaluate specific feed stuff. Another thing that fecal starch does not do is do not tell you site of digestion. Oh, it's high because it was not digested in the room, and probably, but we cannot really be sure of that. The main goal with fecal starch is to be monitoring all these specific groups over time, uh, especially if you have high producing groups. Okay, those are the cows that you need to focus normally because, well, those are the cows that pays the bill, right? So that's the goal. Uh, this is a specific number here. Uh, it's variable depending on who presents uh, about fecal starch. We normally like to keep it under 3%, okay? Uh, I saw a lot of people saying under five. I'm okay with that. 5% is a good number, but we try to keep at three because we want to optimize start digestibility as much as we can. Okay. And if you have greater than 3%, then you just need to start looking for uh, the specific fit stuff. Okay. I normally go first to corn silage. Uh, lack of kernel processing is the number one issue related to high fecal starch numbers. Okay, but may not be, so go first to your silage and after that to the other starchy feeds. And make sure you collect it properly because um, they start in the feces, they keep fermenting for some time after it's excreted. So if you don't collect it properly, you may have issues. So make sure you collect samples from 10% of the animals in the group or in the pen that you want to evaluate. Put those in a bucket and then homogenize well. But make sure you see the cow uh, pooping or you collect a rectal sample because um, if you just go through the pen and get the manure, maybe mix it with urine or maybe there for a lot of time, so part of the starch fermented, and you may have a bias result coming back from the lab. Okay? Uh, if possible, submit the sample frozen or dried uh, because if, if it gets too warm, the sample gets too warm, it keeps fermenting. And if by any chance you change uh, your diet or do any sort of management adjustment, reevaluate that only after two or three weeks, more likely after three weeks, because it takes some time to the cow adapt to the new diet. So you may not see difference right after you change. Okay? And if you evaluate right after you change, you may give up on something that could really work. Okay? And that's not the goal. This is the total tract start digestibility equation I mentioned. So you measure fecal starch, then you just use this equation to predict uh, total tract start digestibility. Uh, normally, the commercial labs, we already have these or a similar equation uh, uh, that they develop uh, to be used on their reports. So you don't really need to worry about that. In most of the commercial labs, they already have NIRs to measure fecal starch. So it's cheaper and easier 
uh, and probably faster <laughs> than a webcam measurement. Okay, so it's it's a it's a really good procedure to evaluate star digestibility. Um, to finish this presentation, I'd like to show you how important it is, and I try to sh uh, how important starch digestibility is, and I try to do that through some fecal starch economics. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we will simulate different scenarios. Uh, I think we have five different scenarios, um, and all those five scenarios use exactly the same diet, so 25% starch in those diets. All the cows will have exactly the same dry matter intake. Uh, for the sake of this uh, specific uh, stimulation, we will assume that corn grain has 70% starch, which means that for each pound of corn you feed, you have 0.7 pounds of starch, and that the starch digestibility measure as seven hours, ruminal in vitro starch digestibility, 70%. Okay, so multiplying 0.7 pounds by 70% means that for each pound of corn, we have close to half a pound of digestible starch, okay? And this is the assumed corn price, okay? I know that may vary a lot from region to region. This, these were Midwest uh, corn grain prices last month. So we try to simulate fecal starch from zero up to 20%, okay? And this is related to that variance I show in corn silage-based diets in that first corn silage slide today. So multiplying uh, starch intake by, uh, sorry, multiplying dry matter intake by starch content in the diet, we have a starch intake, which is similar for all the different scenarios. Uh, using that specific uh, total tract starch digestibility equation by multiplying the fecal starch, those are the total tract starch digestibility values we got. This is slightly lower than what I presented earlier, but I saw those numbers before. And then what we try to do is we multiply start intake by total tract start digestibility and subtract this number from starch intake to see how much starch was lost in the manure. So as fecal starch increase, you see that starch loss increase in pounds per day for each cow. And then we try to calculate how much extra corn grain would I need to feed uh, considering that for, uh, for each pound of grain, we have half pound of digestible starch, we would have to compensate those values here. So this is the amount of corn grain you need to feed extra to compensate for uh, starch excretion in the manure. And then you have the extra price you are paying for that based on that specific corn grain price. Okay. So if you have 10% fecal starch, it means that probably you are losing 25 cents per cup per day, okay? This is a simulation, may not really impact what happens at your farm, okay? Based on the different corn prices you feed or the milk production you have, but it's just to give you an idea on how important starch digestibility is. Um, this is my email from the Miner Institute. I'll keep this email for uh, at least two or three months. Um, so feel free to send me any email with questions. And if you have opportunity, please visit our uh, farm report website. All the researchers here and also the students, they write uh, articles monthly to the farm report. And we normally have very interesting uh, topics going on. Uh, if you have more interest on corn silage, um, I team up with Dr. Shaver uh, in January and February to answer several questions related to corn silage. So you may see a lot of different things related to shredlage, but also to uh, hybrid types, including BMR, if you have interest growing those. So I really recommend the visit to our farm report. Um, do we still have time for some questions? Yeah. Um did you, when you looked at the uh, starch at different levels of digestibility and the amount of corn lost, um, it'd be interesting also to see if somebody didn't add more grain, what the milk loss might be, yep. the value of that milk loss. Because I think my sense is that people who, who have high fecal starch in their herd might not know it. And so the result is probably that, I mean, I'm not sure. But. I agree. No, I agree with you. Uh, the only reason why I didn't add that is because... <laughs> 
I would need to use uh, an equation uh, yeah. to assume the milk production. And then we enter in all sorts of bias related yeah. to calculation. That's why we didn't add. Uh, but if we go back to the uh, initial slide, one of these initial slides, um, I have an equation from this specific uh, graph that could be used for that. So it's, it's doable in a... Give you a sense anyway, right? Yeah, it would, for sure. Okay. So any questions? So sounds like the Pico start should be a good spot to, to start, just to get a sense of where you are. How much do those cost, Louise? Any idea? Oh, I think they are $15, $20 per sample. I can check right now for you. That's I'm in front of my computer, so. Sounds easier than soil sampling, actually. Yeah, is it uh, something Dairy One could do, or who do you typically send those to? Um, I normally send to Dairyland Labs, but I, I, I know the Cumberland Valley does, Dairy One does, um, Rock River Lab does. So I think that the main labs does. So it's something that's easy to. Well, thank you, Louise, for that. My pleasure. Thank you.